I can start. Ahang bante, tisarnena saha pancha zilani ya chami. Dutiampi ahang bante, tisarnena saha pancha zilani ya chami. Tatiampi ahang bante, tisarnena saha pancha zilani ya chami. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. 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 Buddhang saranang gachami. Buddhang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Dhammang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Dutiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Tatiyampi sanghang saranang gachami. Te saranagamanang titang. Ama bante. Pana tipata viramani sikha padang samadhyan. Pana tipata Vedamani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Adinna Dana Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Adinna Dana Vedamani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Kami Sumi Chahajana Vedamani Sikha Padang Samadhi Yami Amesu micha chara veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musavada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Musavada veramani sikha padang samadhyami. Sura miraya Manja Pamadatana Viraman Sikha Padam Samadhyami Sura Meriya Manja Pamadatana Viraman Sikha Padam Samadhyami Imani Pancha Sikha Padani Sidena Sugating Yanti Sidena Bhoga Sampada Sidena Nibuting Yanti Tasma si dang so dhagyam. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, 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 sadhu. We will now begin our reading of the Visuddhi Maga. We will take turns reading, going in alphabetical order. Please read one paragraph if it's long and two paragraphs if it's short. We are currently at chapter 1, paragraph 157. Sanda, can you please start us off, please? 
Thank you. Yes. Uh, 157, having thus shown by means of the mass, mass of fire and has as its conditions of the five chords of sense desire by the, to the same intent he showed by the following simil similes of the horse hair robe, the sharp spear, the iron sheet, the iron ball, the iron bed, the iron chair, and the iron pauldron, the pain that has as its condition acceptance of homage and rever uh, reverential salutation and the use of robes, arms, food, bed, and chair, and dwelling by unvirtuous bhikkhus. What do you think, bhikkhus, which is better, that one should have a strong horse hair rope twisted round both legs by a strong man and tightening so that it cuts through the outer skin and having cut through the outer skin it cut through the inner skin and having cut through the inner skin it cut through the flesh and having cut through the flesh it cut through the sinews and having cut through the sinews, it cut through the bones, and having cut through the bones, it remained crushing the bone marrow, or that he sh should consent to the homage of great warrior nobles, great brahmans, great ho householders. And what do you think, Bhikkhus, which is better, that one should have a strong man wound one's breast with a sharp spear tempered in oil or that he should consent to the reverential salutation of great warrior nobles, great brahmans, great householders. And what do you think, because which is better, that one's body should be wrapped by a strong man in a red hot iron sheet burning, blazing and glowing, or that he should use robes given out of faith by great warrior nobles, great brahmans, great householders. And what do you think, because which is better, that one's mouth should be prized open by a strong man with red hot iron tongues burning, blazing and glowing, and that into his mouth should be put a red hot iron ball burning, blazing, glowing, which burns his lips and burns his mouth and tongue and throat and belly and passes out below, carrying with it his bowels and entrails, or that he should use arms for given out of faith by great warrior nobles. And what do you think, because which is better, that one should have a strong man size him by the head or seize him by the shoulders and sit him or lay him on a red hot iron bed or iron chair, chair burning, blazing and glowing, or that he should use a bed or chair given out of faith by great warrior nobles? And what do you think, because which is better, that one should have a strong man take him feet up and head down and plunge him into a red hot metal cauldron burning, blazing and glowing to be boiled there in a swirl of froth and as he boils in the swirl of froth to be swept now up, now down, and now across, or that he should use a dwelling given out of faith by a great war. 158. What pleasure has a man of broken virtue, forsaking not sense pleasures which bear fruit, of pain more violent even than the pain in the embracing of, of a mass of fire? What pleasure has he in accepting homage? Who having failed in virtue must partake of pain that will excel in agony. The crushing of his legs with 
Os hea robes. What pleasure has a man devoid of virtue, except in salutations of the faithful, which is which is the cause of pain acuter still than pain produced by stabbing with a spear? What is the pleasure in the use of garments for one without restraint, whereby in hell he will he will for long be forced to undergo the contact of the blazing iron sheet although to him his arms would may seem tasty who has no virtue it is dearest poison because of which he surely will be made for long to swallow burning iron bowls and when the virtueless make use of couches and chairs though reckon pleasing this pain because they will be tortured long indeed on red hot blazing iron beds and chairs then what delight is there for one virtuous inhabiting a dwelling given in faith since for that reason he will have to dwell shut up inside a blazing iron pan the teacher of the world in him condemning described him in these terms of suspect habits full of corruption lecherous as well by nature he will rotten to within so out upon the life of him abiding the restraint of him that wears the guise of the ascetic that he will not be and damages and undetermines himself what is the life he leads since any person no matter who with virtue to his credit avoids it here as those that would look well keep far away from dung or from corpse or from a corpse he is not free from any sort of terror though free enough from pleasure of attainment while heaven's door is bolted fast against him he is well set up set upon the road to hell who else if not one destitute of virtue more fit to be object of compassion many indeed and grave are the defects that brand a man and neglectful of his virtue seeing danger in the failure of virtue should be understood as reviving in such ways as these and seeing benefits in perfected virtue should be understood in the opposite sense 159 furthermore his virtue is immaculate his wearing of the bowl and robes gives pleasure and inspires trust his going forth will bear its fruit a bhikkhu in his virtue pure has never feared that self reproach will enter in his heart indeed there is no darkness in the sun a bhikkhu in his virtue bright shines forth in the ascetic's wood as by the brightness of his beams the moon lights up the firmament now if the bodily perfume of virtuous bhikkhus can succeed in pleasing even deities what of the perfume of his virtue it is more perfect far than all the other perfumes in the world because the perfume virtue gives is borne unchecked in all directions the deeds done for a virtuous man though they be few will bear much fruit and so the virtuous man becomes a vessel of honor and renown there are no cankers here and now to plague the virtuous man at all the virtuous man digs out the root of suffering in lives to come perfection among human kind and even among deities if wished for it is not hard to gain for him whose virtue is perfected but once his virtue is perfected his mind then seeks no other kind 
than the perfection of Nibbana, the state where utter peace prevails. Such is the blessed fruit of virtue, showing full many a varied form, so let a wise man know it well, this root of all perfection's branches. One who understands thus shudders at failure in virtue and reaches out towards the perfecting of virtue. So virtue should be cleansed with all care, seeing this danger of failure in virtue and this benefit of the perfection of virtue in the way stated. 161. And at this point in the path of purification, which is shown under the headings of virtue, concentration, and understanding by the stanza, when a wise man established well in virtue, virtue, firstly, has been fully illustrated. The first chapter called The Description of Virtue in the Path of Purification, composed for the purpose of gladdening good people. Sadhu. Sadhu. I think we've finished chapter one now. Yeah, it's also the first part of the book. So there are three parts for section three Nidesa. And this is the first Nidesa. It's shorter than the other two. It's also the first of the Visuddhis. See the Visuddhi. The ascetic practices, Dutanga Nidesa. Now, while a meditator is engaged in the pursuit of virtue, he should set about undertaking the ascetic practices in order to perfect those special qualities of fewness of wishes, contentment, etc., by which the virtue of the kind already described is cleansed. For when his virtue is thus washed clean of stains by the waters of such special qualities as fewness of wishes, contentment, effacement, seclusion, dispersal, energy, and modest needs, it will become quite purified, and his vows will succeed as well. And so when his whole behavior has been purified by the special quality of blameless virtue and vows, he has become established in the first three of the ancient noble one's heritages. He may become worthy to, to attain to the fourth called delight in development. And I think that references in Guru Nikaya 2.27. Um, uh, we shall call, we shall therefore begin in the explanation of the ascetic practices. The 13 kinds of ascetic, uh, ascetic practices. 13 kinds of ascetic practices have been allowed by the Blessed One to clansmen who have taken up the things of the flesh, and regardless of body and life, are desirous of undertaking a practice in conformity with their aim. They are. The refuse rag wearer's practice, the triple robe wearer's practice, the alms, alms food eater's practice, the house to house seeker's practice, the one sessioner's practice, the bowl food eater's practice, the later food refuser's practice, the forest dweller's practice, the tree root dweller's practice, the open air dweller's practice, the charnel ground dweller's practice. The any bed user's practice, the sitter's practice. 3. Herein, 1. As to meaning, 2. Characteristics, etc. The undertaking and directions, and then the grade and breach as well, and benefits of each besides. 4. As to the profitable triad, 5. Ascetic and so on distinguished six and as two groups and also seven singly the exposition should be known or one herein as to meaning in the first place by it is uh, refuse pensucula since owing to its being found on refuse in any such place as a street, a charnel ground, or a midden, it belongs, as it were, to the refuse in the sense of being dumped in any one of these places. Or alternatively, like refuse, it gets to a vile state. Thus it is refuse, pamsukula, it goes to a vile state, is what is meant. 
The wearing of a refuse rag, which has acquired its derivative name in this way, is refuse rag wearing. That is its habit. Thus, he is a refuse rag wearer, Pemtukulika. The practice, Enga, of the refuse rag wearer is the refuse rag wearer's practice, Pemtukula Kinganga. It is the action that is called the practice. Therefore, it should be understood as a term for that by anyone, any, a term for that by undertaking which one becomes a refuse rag wearer. Two, in the same way, he has the habit of wearing the triple robe, the chivara, in other words, the cloak of patches, the upper garment, and the inner clothing. Thus, he is a triple robe wearer, the chivara, his practice is called the triple robe wear practice. I've, I've read the third paragraph, but I don't understand. So I thought that, uh, for example, for the refuse rag wearer's practice, it will be like one to mean that's what it means, uh, what I read there. And these is are the it? meanings first. Okay, so it here is like with i and two eyes and three eyes. oh it's not i understand thank you five the dropping pata of the lamb's pinda of material substance amisa or ams beku is ams food pinda pata the falling nipatana into the bowl of lamb's pinda given by others, is what is meant. He cleans that lamb's food, that falling of lamps. He seeks it by approaching such and such a family. Thus he is called an lamb's food eater, Pinda Patika. Or his vow is to gather pat, pat, patitam, the lamp Pinda, thus he is a lamp gatherer, Pinda Patting. Together is to wander for. A lamp gatherer, Pinda Patin, is the same as an alms food eater, Pinda Patika. The practice of the alms food eater is the alms food eater's practice. Six. It is a hiatus that is called a gap, Dana. It is removed, Apita, from a gap, thus it is called gapless, Apadana. The meaning is, it is without hiatus. It is together with saha, what is gapless, apadana. Thus it is with the gapless, sapadana, devoid of hiatus, from house to house, is what is meant. His habit is to wonder on what is with the gapless. Thus, he's a gapless wanderer, Sapadana Charin. A gapless wanderer is the same as a house to house seeker, Sapadana Charika. His practice is the house to house seeker's practice. Uh, what, what is hiatus? A break. Uh, the Pali word here for gapless. A apadana is that um the, the same word as like the the apadana in in terms of like the um past life stories or or related to to that usage of a apadana no it's a different etymology thank you so going from house to house uh, i mean is is that even allowable or you just uh, stay there and see if you, someone wants to give how, how is this practiced you're jumping ahead that will all be explained this part is probably not that interesting for most people this is just a etymology lesson basically it's like asking the question why are these words being used to 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 call each of these uh, the break from what means making a break from one house to the next 
skipping a house. Or a bhikkhu should not skip a house. These are Dutanga practices. So someone keeping this Dutanga practice wouldn't skip the houses. Anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll learn more about them in the later paragraphs. Seven, five. Eating in one session is one session. He has that habit. Thus, he, he is a one-sessioner. His practice is the one-sessioner's practice. Six, arms, pinda, in one bowl, pata, only because of refusing a second vessel is bowl arms, pata pinda. Now making bowl arms, pata pinda, the name for the taking of arms food in the bowl, bowl arms food is his habit, thus he is a bowl food pata pindika. His practice is the bowl food, food eater's practice. Eight, seven. No, Kalu is a particle in the sense of refusing food, but uh, obtained later by one who has shown that he is satisfied is called later food. Pacha Bhatta. The eating of that later food is later food eating, making later food Pacha Bhatta, the name for that later food eating. Later food is his habit. Thus, he is a later food eater. Pacha Bhattika. Not a later food eater is a no later food eater. Kalupacha Bhattika. That is a later food refuser. This is the name for one who, had, who, who has an undertaking refuses extra food. Who as an undertaking refuses extra food. But it is said in the commentary, Kalu is a certain kind of bird. When it has taken a fruit into its beak and that drops, it does not eat anymore. This beak is like that. Thus, he is a later food refuser. Kalu Pacha Bhattika. His practice is the later food refuser's practice. Nine. Eight. His habit is dwelling in the forest. Thus he is a forest dweller. His practice is the forest dweller's practice. Nine. Dwelling at the root of a tree is treat root dwelling. He has that habit. Thus he is a treat root, tree root dweller. The practice of the tree root deller, dweller is the tree root dweller's practice. 10. 11. Likewise, with the open air dweller and the charnel ground dweller. And 12. Only what has been distributed, yad, eva, santata, is as distributed, yatha, santata. Data. This is a term for the resting place first allotted thus. This one falls to you. He has the habit of dwelling in that as distributed. Thus he is an as distributed user. Yatha Santatika. That is an any bed user. His practice is the any bed user's practice. Thirteen. He has the habit of keeping to the sitting posture when resting, refusing to lie down. Thus, he is a sitter. His practice is the sitter's practice. So, habit is probably not, it's a bit confusing translation. This is the word sila, which we've been he's been translating as virtue in, in that context. But sila is something like norm. So it means that he just has it as his behavior. It's not exactly a habit. It just means it. that's his behavior. That's what he does. It's a simple way of saying that's what he does, and that's what he does regularly. That's what he normally does. And that's what he regularly does. That's what he always does, basically. So, Bante, how is this not uh, Sila Bhattaparamasas? 
rites and rituals that one thinks that will purify their, I don't know, behavior, mind, or what? Because they will help to purify the mind. So why is, isn't this called Silabhata Paramasa? Because that refers to practices that don't help purify the mind. Yeah, like, like uh, 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 living like a dog, living like a, a cow, thinking that uh, torturing yourself that they will lead to uh, liberation. More commonly, it would be uh, sacrificing oil, butter at an altar, or sacrificing animals at the altar. What's it supposed to be? But sacrificing butter or uh, doing chanting at an altar or that kind of thing is a common thing in Buddhist time. A lot of meaningless practices that they gave meaning to. Going naked, in line with what Sanka saying, going naked was quite common. Saying that somehow that's valuable. And also, uh, like uh, submerging yourself in water, thinking it'll, it's going to purify you. Torturing yourself. One of the more bizarre ones that I that I heard about once was in, in India. There's some people they'll they'll circle around a mountain doing a chant, and the the ones who and it you know takes them se several weeks to do the journey. And some of the ones who are real obsessive about it, what they'll do is instead, at, or no, they'll do that until they go through the whole circle of beads before they'll take a step, and it takes them like their whole life to circle the mountain doing this. And they think just you know making it a long, grueling process so, somehow makes it better. Page 57, 11. All these, however, are the practices. Anga, a bhikkhu, who is ascetic. Dutta, because he has shaken off dutta, defilement, by undertaking one or other of them. Or the knowledge that he has got the name ascetic, dutta, because it shakes off dunana, defilement, is a practice, anga, belonging to these, thus they are ascetic practices, dutanga. Or alternatively, they are ascetic, dutta, because they shake off nidunana, opposition, and they are practices, anga, because they are a way of patipati. This, firstly, is how the exposition should be known here as to meaning. All of them have as their characteristic the volition of undertaking, for this is said in the commentary, who, he who does the undertaking is a person, that whereby he does the undertaking is, is states of consciousness and consciousness concomitants. The, the volition of the act of undertaking is the ascetic practice. Uh, what it rejects is the instance. All have the function of eliminating cupidity, and they manifest themselves with the production of non-cupidity. For their proximate cause, they have the noble states consisting of units of wishes and so on. This is how the exposition should be known as to characteristic, etc. 13. 3. As regards the five beginning with the undertaking and directions, during the Blessed One's lifetime, all ascetic practices should be undertaken in the Blessed One's presence. After his attainment of Nibbana, this should be done in the presence of a principal disciple. When he is not available, it should be done in the presence of one whose cankers are destroyed, of a non-returner of a once returner, of a stream mentor, of one who knows the three pitakas, of one who knows two of the pitakas, of one who knows one of the pitakas, of one who knows one collection, of a teacher of the commentaries. When he is not available, it should be done in the presence of an observer of an ascetic practice. When he is not available, then after one is swept out, the, the shrine terrace they can be undertaken in a reversal posture as though pronouncing them in the fully enlightened one's presence. Also, it is permitted to undertake them by oneself. And here should be told the story of the senior 
of the two brothers, who were elders at Chityapabata, in their fewness of wishes, with respect to the ascetic practices. This, firstly, is what applies to all the practices. 14. Now we shall proceed to comment on the undertaking, directions, grade, breach, and benefits of each one separately. 1. First, the refuse rag wearer practice Rarer's practice is undertaken with one of these two states. I refuse robes given by householders, or I undertake the refuse rag wearer's practice. This, firstly, is the undertaking. 15. One who has done this should get a robe of one of the following kinds one from a charnel ground, one from a shop. A cloth from a street, a cloth from a midden, one from a childbed, an ablu ablution cloth, a cloth from a washing place, one worn going to and returning from the charna ground, one scorched by fire, one gnawed, gnawed by cattle, one gnawed by ants, one gnawed by rats, one cut at the end, one cut at the edge, one carried as a flag, a robe from a shrine, an ascetic's robe, one from a consecration, one produced by supernormal power, one from a highway, one born by the wind, one presented by deities, one from the sea. Taking one of these robe cloths, he should tear off and throw away the weak parts and then wash the sound parts and make up a robe. He can use it after getting rid of his old robe given by householders. 16. Herein, one from a charnel ground is one dropped on a charnel ground. One from a shop is one dropped at the door of a shop. A cloth from the street is a cloth thrown into a street from inside a window by those who seek merit. A cloth from a midden is a cloth thrown onto a place for rubbish. One from a child bed is a cloth thrown away after wiping up the stains of childbirth with it. The mother of Kissa the minister, it seems, had the stains of childbirth wiped up with a cloth worth a hundred pieces and thinking... The refuse rag wearer will take it. She had thrown it onto the Tala, uh, Talavelli's road. Bikus took it for the purpose of mending worn places. Is one that people who are made by divas to bathe themselves, including their heads, are accustomed to throw away as a cloth of a luck. A cloth from washing place is rags thrown away at a washing place where bathing is done. One one going to and coming from is one that people throw away after they have gone to a charnel ground and returned and bath. One scorched by fire is one partly scorched by fire for people throw that away. One not by cattle, etc. are obvious for people throw away such as these two. One carry as a flag those who board a ship do so after hoisting a flag. It is allowable to take this when they have gone out of sight. Also, it is allowable when the two armies have gone away to take a flag that has been hoisted on a better field. I read 13 earlier, and I wanted to ask um, the word for cankers. Is this kilesa or something else? I think it's Asawa that he translates as canker. Thank you. A rope from a shrine is an offering made by draping a termite mound in cloth. An ascetic's robe is one belonging to a bhikkhu. One from a consecration is one thrown away at the king's consecration place. One produced by supernormal power is a kum biku rope. 
One from a highway is one dropped in the middle of a road, but one dropped by the owner's negligence should be taken only after waiting a while. One borne by the wind is one that falls a long way off, having been carried by the wind. It is allowable to take it if the owners are not in sight. One presented by deities is one given by deities, like that given to the elder Anuruddha. One from the sea is one washed up on dry land by the sea waves. So that that, that one is uh, maybe require the one born of wind requires some uh, explanation because uh, suppose a uh, monk uh, is walking in the street and uh, 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 a cloth hung in a cloth line gets blown away and comes to the street and the monk clearly knows that it's uh, the cloth of the owner but the, maybe the owner is not in the house gone out maybe that cloth is not proper to take when the monk knows that this cloth belongs to this owner yeah, it's not like if it blows off of someone's clothesline onto the ground, you can take it. The 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 point it's making in several instances is relation in relation to ownership. If it's clear that ownership has been abandoned, then you can take it. Nineteen. One given thus, we give it order or got by those who go out for all, is not a refuse rag. And in the case of one presented by a bhikkhu, one given after it has been got at a presentation of robes by householder at the end of the reigns or a refuge, one automatically supplied by a householder to the occupant of a certain resting place is not a refuse rag. It is a refuse rag only one given after not having been so obtained, and herein that placed by the donors at a goose feet, but given by that bhikkhu to the refuse rag wearer by placing it in his hand is called pu pure in one way, that given to a bhikkhu but by placing it in his hand but placed by him at the refuse uh, rag wearer's feet is also pure in one way that which is both placed at his feet and then given by him in the same way is pure in both ways one obtained by being placed in the hand and given by being placed in the hand too is not a strict man's robe so a refuse rag wearer should use the robe after getting to know about the kinds of refuse rags these are the directions for it who should uh, take up this practice um, because who don't have their uh, sila purified or even if I mean, I think I think I heard like Mahakasapa and many uh, like Arahants who would still take these. Yeah. Was it was it taught by the Buddha? Yeah, this sort of thing is taught by the Buddha. And also, there are two dutangas that are uh, recommended for lay people who are like keeping to eight precepts. One is. Uh, Ekasanikanga, then the other one is uh, Pattapindikanga. It's for several one. that lay people can keep. You'll, you'll see it, it, it explains which are to be kept by lay people. We don't think this is just for monks. There's a many, there's several of them that are so appropriate for lay people. It's good to hear. And is it, um, you know, part of it too, you know, uh, you know, so, somewhat due to the, um, you know, I, I guess the, the specifics of the the meditator, like, you know, so, some who, you know, may already be very developed, uh, you know, mentally in their meditation practice, they just might naturally have a proclivity to these practices because, you know, 
just f- fits in with, I guess, their um, you know habits or way of practice already. And then I've also heard on the flip side, uh, you know, th- those who need to put in a lot of work, it's also recommended for you know to you know basically put put in as much effort to get the most out if they you know, still need to ha- have a lot of development to do in the practice. And then, you know, I, everything in the middle kind of, you know, depends on the the needs of the meditator. Is that is that correct? I don't think it's likely for it to be a natural thing for people to do. Um, it's undertaken by enlightened beings and that's, um, continuation of what they were taught and as an in inspiration for others. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, I think I think what it I was trying to say is kind of... As a, as, it can also be a support for one's, as it says, fewness of wishes, so one might keep them in order to uh, support a simple life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think like... Uh, with like the... here in Thailand... Here in Thailand, when we get a lot of food, eating one meal is, has proven to be quite valuable because it uh, gets you out of a lot of invitations. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and uh, what we said was like the, the enlightened um, beings. I, I I think that's probably what I um, you know had heard previously as far as those who would you know, ha- have the habit of doing it. I, I, I agree. I don't think someone who's not enlightened would na- naturally incline towards those. So the one session of practice can be a little tricky, I guess, uh, because in the morning, if uh, uh, you are, uh, a monk is offered uh, food, then if it is not enough, monk might refuse, I guess, uh, thinking that you might get a bigger meal uh, for before noon, but even then, if mm-hmm. he doesn't get, no, I don't know what you were referring to. Uh, uh, the one. I think you're misunderstanding how it works. I think you're you're probably looking at it from the point perspective of Sri Lanka, where people bring a meal or something. This is relating. This is much more related to pindapata. But either way, suppose we take in Sri Lanka how it normally goes, people bring double dana. Or oh, sorry, heel, heel dana, what's the morning one? Heel dana? Yeah, heel dana. Yeah, morning is heel dana. Okay, so, so if they bring it, then you just keep that food for later. Have it together with double dana if it's not enough. Oh, yeah. No problem. I mean, there's other rules that are problematic. Um, there was a time where... Uh, we were we when we when Goenka came to Toronto, and the Sri Lankan community hosted him. Some Sri Lankan person, I, apparently, they there's this practice where they don't taste the food, because if they taste the food, they're eating that's eating monks' food. So when they're cooking the food, they don't taste it. And someone had put basically a whole package of salt, a whole box of salt or something, in this this food. And they kept bringing it back to us, and I was saying, you know, I can't, I can't refuse this food, or else I won't be able to take more of other food. So the way they do it in Sri Lanka, and I don't agree with that this is an issue as well. They shouldn't do this. Come around uh, with the bowls and and say, would you like some of this? Would you like some of this? Because if I say no to one thing, then uh, I can't say yes to something else. So this practice that's become a, a very Cultural practice is problematic for monks, and it means they break rules because they come around with all the different bowls. Would you like some of this? And if I say no, so I would start just saying, well, just a little bit, and I would take a little bit of everything. I thought I wanted more. It was, it was, uh, well, I guess that's the right way. You know? I mean, it is good that you don't you don't have preference, but yeah, uh, and. Uh, Tasting the food when preparing, 
to see whether it's okay or not. I don't think that I was uh, I was I was told that when I when I when I explained about this, I said this why why was that how could it be that this dish was so incredibly salty that nobody could eat it? And he said and some monk told me in Canada I said I don't know why they don't want to taste it because they feel like that's eating monk's food. Do they, do they cook um like using own like one pot for monks food and they they don't set aside after and then eat part of it? If they cook like a viand and it's some people don't some people don't believe it. Some people believe that's wrong. I don't think it's I I don't think it's proper, but they I, mean, I don't think they should be so strict, but some people are and they apparently and they will refuse to even have the slightest taste of of what they're cooking because they they feel like this is the monk's food. Oh, I see. Because when you're cooking, it's not food uh, ready to be offered uh, yet. So it's fine. Once it is prepared, then you shouldn't eat uh, uh, before offering the monks. I don't see the difference. You're just making arbitrary rules. You're just making an arbitrary distinction. I would say once yeah, it's offered I, to the monk, once it's offered to the monk, then you shouldn't taste it until the monk is Then it no longer belongs to you, then it belongs to the monks. And until you give it, it doesn't belong. I mean, I think it's a it's a it's a sort of a an inspiring uh austerity for people to say that, for people to to be so reverential. And it is reverential that that they will just say all of this food we don't want it because the it's very easy for for unwholesomeness to arise in the mind. And in order to keep it perfectly pure, you make clear in your mind that not one bit of this is going to be taken from the monks because you have in your mind I'm giving all of this to the monks. But if you say I'll give some to the monks, but I'll keep some for me. Then that's greed. Or it could be because of greed. I want to taste this delicious food as well. But you say, no, all of this is going to be not even one little speck of it. Will be okay. Yeah, but Bansha, you can think of uh, tasting the tasting to see whether it's ready is part of cooking. And well, you, until yeah, you confirm you're it. Just, you're just saying that. You know, you're saying that. They're saying no, you can't. Yeah, we we don't follow. I, mean, I, I, I would That's I, I would argue that if you if you if you're concerned about it being edible, you should probably taste it. That's why you should taste it. You should you should say yes. I don't want to take away any of this, but that's not why I'm tasting it. I'm tasting it so that it will be. Proper to serve. To them. Are there are there some foods that are usually never offered to monks? Like, can you offer chips or candy? We certainly can. Monk may or may not accept it. Though. I mean, I guess I guess for the most part they have to. What is it? Um, it's it's complicated. Like there's. Uh, there's two kinds of food. There's there's uh, sort of like the more staple food and then non-staple food. And it's the staple food that if you if you refuse it, no food. I think with, you could you could refuse things like candy. I think I can't remember exactly the details of it. I, normally we just accept it all and then we decide whether or not. And what about um, accepting uh, meats or animal products? If, if those are rejected, would that be like the same as rejecting a staple food, or would that be like comparable to rejecting like uh, candy or you know something like that? Well, meat is definitely staple. Does it really matter? Isn't it all just food? <laughs> well, when a monk goes on alms round, they only take so much as can fill the bowl. But suppose they got all candy to fill the bowl, and they could. I don't know. In modern times, it's not really an issue because it's all packaged. 
in, in Thailand anyway, in Sri Lanka, they put actual uh, rice and beans and legumes in, in, directly into the bowl. Uh, and sweets as well. They use a leaf to separate it, right, Bhante? Like, uh, Sometimes, yeah. Usually. Like, yeah. Banana leaf. Yeah. Thank you, Bhante. We've passed the hour, so we will stop our reading there. Now is the time for any questions related to the text, if you have any. Is there a rule that if someone recognizes the cloth that they lost, um, should the monk return it? Yeah. There's no rule uh, because the monk could under the impression that it was abandoned. But in fact, um, in certain circumstances, if they didn't abandon it, if they didn't give it back when they found that out, that would be stealing it. But when they first took it, it they thought to themselves, this is worthless. But the second time, or this, in the second instance, once they find out that it has an owner, then uh, holding on to it would be stealing. I think there's a story uh, about a layman keeping a robe that was blown away from a temple and uh, he didn't return it knowing that uh, and uh, because of that I think he was born in hell or something. Yeah, I and think sort of like uh, in, the, in the case of a hurricane or something, tornado, where really the wind carries it far, far away. And you can say, well, there's no there's no way I could find out who this belongs to, and there's no way that the owners could ever find it. So we consider this to be an ownerless. That's how you look at it. You look at a piece of cloth and you say, is it clear that this has no owner? So then we can use it. And sort of the flip side of that, uh, when a lay person you know, throws out cloth and a, a bhikkhu takes it to use it as a, a robe, does that um, serve as good karma for the the person who threw out the cloth? It, you know, in a similar way, but maybe to a lesser extent, um, as if they had offered the the cloth as a robe. Does is it still uh, be beneficial to them when someone picks it out of the trash to use? Karma um, is mental volition, mental information, state of mind, and you do state of mind at every moment. So if, so if they threw it out without thinking about it, then no. But if, if they threw it out and you know made the resolve, if you know any bhikkhus can use these, may they take them out of the trash? Would would that be enough volition to connect it? If it happened, then they even if someone don't... sees a monk do it, I'm so sad. Oh, good, good. In uh, in the. Uh, uh, Book it uh, mentions an ins instance where a woman or the mother of a minister called this, uh, she threw away a cloth which is very valuable, like uh, 100 gold coins valuable cloth after using it to wipe off uh, you know, a pregnant woman. Uh, whatever uh, excrement uh, with the intention that may it uh, become a, a robe for a bhikkhu and the bhikkhus uh, got it and used it to uh, uh, fix other robes so that's, that's an instance where a lay person throwing away uh, would uh, be much meritorious. Thank you, Sanka. Sanka. And where did you say that story was from? Uh, I see that in the Sinhalese version. Uh, oh. Uh, on on the 23 uh, types of uh, clothes that are proper. In the, the same chapter? Oh. Sotia, the type called Sotia. 
I'll have to probably refer. mention it here as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm I'm looking for it right now. I I don't know if I'm just missing it, but I I, I might need to spend a little bit more time. Um, version, but it it's in in the same chapter you said. So uh, it mentions uh, twenty three types of uh, clothes, mm-hmm. right? So in that section, the fifth one, Sotya, it uh, mentions the name of the minister. Uh, his name is Tista, mm-hmm. and uh, his mother did this, like uh, mm-hmm. three away a cloth that is like hundred gold, hundred uh, mm-hmm. hundred coins worth cloth. And the big cost took it. Hmm. And she had the intention let it be cheaper for big cost. Mm-hmm. Oh, thank you. It's a, a very, very good story. It's uh, I, I don't think uh, the, the, the commentary has an English translation, unfortunately. I know sometimes uh, commentary and in, uh, in his book when he goes over extracts from the Vasudhi so it might 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 be in there too. So when because we're collecting um, pieces of cloth uh, in order to create a robe for for themselves, as I understood, and maybe there. Are, there are mentions in the text. They would sew them together and then would would color them, dye them. And that process of dyeing is for people to recognize that they. Well, let's make it all one color, and to make it not white. Or did did I did my answer go through there? Yes. Yes. Um... I have another question. I have a robe first. There are two parts, as I understood. Uh, it is given. That's the question. Oh, when, when a robe is given to, uh, it has to be placed in the hand and at the feet. And why? the question is why, why that is the proper way? That's not what it says. What the text says is that any time of if if it's if a, if a robe is given to the monk directly, then it can't be considered a thrown away robe. But if it's given to one monk directly and that monk throws it away, then it's also not pure. Or if it's thrown away and a monk picks it up and gives it to another monk, then it's also not pure completely. For the purpose of this uh, Dutanga. Uh in Theravada monasteries, are are there actually uh, monks who still get these kinds of robes? Because I, I usually see uh, the the clean, uh, new looking like orange robes for, for all Theravada monks I've seen. Well, they do ceremonially get them. There's two ways they ceremonially get them. Uh, and people will actually drop them on on the path. The most common way now is people make a a, a fake tree and they bring the tree to the monastery, and there's a robe under it, and they do this whole ceremony. It's funny. I I, I was recently at one, and I realized I think I thought before is that when they say um, they do a chanting where they say. We give, we hereby give this rag robe or this uh, cast off robe to the to the sangha. May the sangha receive it. And it's kind of funny because the whole point is that you're not received, that you're not giving. It's not being given. It's not being received as a gift. It's being taken as 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 something thrown away. They do a big ceremony out of it, and they just don't offer the robe. They put the robe under the tree, and the monk goes to the tree, and the monk takes it from the tree. Imani jivrani asamikani my hung papunanti. I guess if you uh, 
don't offer to the monk technically you didn't offer just put it somewhere with the intention with the hope that the monk would pick it up second comment there's a story of a deva a, a female deva who was married to i think it's anuruddha in the past life and she hides a, 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 a celestial robe at the bottom of a refuge pile with just a corner sticking out. And Anuruddha comes along, he's looking for rags in, in the refuse pile. And he sees this corner of a robe and he pulls it out and he says, wow, this is quite a cast off robe. But it's this celestial, incredibly refined. And... I imagine that. A hibikuchiyura would also be like something celestial, since it is like created with Hindi. Dante, is there a rule for lay people um, to give food? For example, like they cannot give leftover food to the monks? Lay people don't have rules. Only the monks have rules. So there are a so lot of I'm... cultural rules depending on which culture you come from. So if you ask Sri Lankan people, they might tell you one thing. Thai people might tell you something else. There are some rules that are cultural that would probably be agreed upon. Uh, and then there are some rules that are rules in the sense that if you did that, it's it's pretty clear that you would be if you did if you did something. But not talking about what you just said, but there might be rules where something if you did that something it would be pretty clearly unwholesome. And that would be thereby kind of in, in that way against the rules of goodness. And there's different categories. Of it. So, um, so early in the morning when you go for arms round, you get the fresh food. I mean, all the monks get or expect fresh food, freshly made. I, I don't, I don't, Care whether it's fresh or day old or whatever. I see, so it doesn't matter. But when a monk and shares if it's, their if it's food, spoiled, if it's spoiled, then I see. But when a monk shares their food, <clears throat> share their food, um, does it have to be fresh? I mean, a monk share with another monk. I mean, it has to be that morning, so that's pretty fresh. All right, yes. Thank you. Well, when Natapala asked the servant girl to put some spoiled food to his uh, bowl, so monks don't really care. I mean, enlightened beings don't really care about the condition of the food. But having said that, when you offer food uh, arms as a lay person, if you prepare it with respect, prepare it cleanly, then that deed is more meritorious than giving away leftover food. And I mean, it, it should be. Mostly it would be. But it's still not about what you do, it's about how you do it. You have, suppose you've been eating and you've got, you've got just one or two hands, one or two bitefuls left, and then a Pacheka Buddha walks by. And you give the last two spoonfuls to your Pacheka Buddha. And if you do it thinking this is some special being, that would be pretty meritorious too. Nati chitte pasannam hirapakana matakina. There is no such thing when given with a mind that is bright. Such a thing as a small gift. There's no such thing. There's no such thing when the bright mind one gives that which is called a small gift. It's, it can't be called small if it's given with the bright mind. Uh, and then, sorry, that's not the whole. That's not the whole quote. The, the second part is tathagate vasambuddhe atavata sasalaka. Either to the given, either to the Buddha who is perfectly enlightened, but the perfectly enlightened Tagata or his... Uh, very, very good thing to keep in mind. I 
I, I like that one a, a lot. It reminds me of the the stories in the um, the Manavati when um, you know the, the devas are recollecting their actions, and a lot of them were just re- re- really really small, simple things, uh, and it had very big results for a lot of them. Of course, I mean, uh, you, and if you give a gift to an animal, if it can give like a hundredfold uh, result, uh, imagine giving to an enlightened being, or even to a, a monk who is not enlightened but struggling. Yeah, it, it, immeasurable benefit. <laughs> very. Very good thing. If anyone has any other questions that are unrelated to the text, but related to meditation practice or Buddhism, feel free to ask it now. Yes, I guess. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, of offerings and uh, so forth, I, I haven't checked the the requisite uh, channel yet, but I I know um, Bhante Siri Tando just recently ordained. Um, Will, will we um, be having opportunities to to offer requisites, or will that be posted in the the channel soon? Okay, so I have a question from chapter one. In paragraph one fifty eight, the last four lines of the poem. Um, does it say that those who are destitute of virtue, um, they are in the state of suffering. And because of that, they deserve compassion. And doesn't matter what is their mental state, virtuous or unvirtuous, they, they deserve it. It's not deserve, it's that they are someone who evokes compassion. It's just way of, way of, way of saying that. This is a person who is is destined for great suffering, and that's who evokes compassion. When we realize oh, this, of all the people in the world, this person is suffering more than others. It would be hard to understand, though, if it is mental suffering. I mean, if someone is suffering mentally, it would be hard to understand and show the compassion. You mean it's hard to know that they are suffering? Yeah. Um, that's not the point. I mean, if you find out that this person is completely corrupt and um, with no ethics and great suffering and destined for great suffering. So do you think, Bhante, um, unvirtuous people, um, it can help return them to virtuousness? Uh, it keeps us from being cruel. Keeps us from rejoicing in, in, in their suffering, or it keeps us from wanting them to suffer. If someone does something terrible to you, it's very easy, well, it's very hard not to wish them suffering. But when you think about how much they're going to have to suffer for their evil deeds, you can let go of that. The point of compassion is not to help the other person, it's to have a good quality of mind for yourself. Uh, Thank you. The Buddha, the Buddha had a much compassion towards uh, Devadatta himself. It was said that the uh, Buddha was watching his mind to see how he can be helped. Even such a evil person. I also wanted to know. Uh, so we don't have the choice to uh, whether we want to show compassion or not to show compassion. So we have to be compassionate anyhow. Is that correct? We don't have to do anything. That's true. Thank you. I have a question about um, the booklet um, regarding the benefits of walking meditation. Is there a concept that um, walking meditation is beneficial in sustaining a clear samadhi in everyday life or 
is that not one of the benefits? Well, the fifth benefit is that it lasts, the samadhi lasts for a long time. That's why we do walking before sitting, because it can help with sitting. And is reaching the, the jhanas one of the goals of this kind of vipassana meditation? And also, um, is it possible to have be in the state of the jhanas post equipoise? Oh, like the four jhanas of um it's still not, not that simple. Right. That's all for me this week. Thank you for coming. I appreciate that you all come up to study. This text is not easy, so thank you for your Thank you so much, Bhante. Thank you. Uh, thank you.